Hello, and welcome to Banff Centre Talks. My name is Alison Brock. My guest today once said that being an artist is like being in a bar fight. You gotta grab whatever you got and go for it. I have known Tom Wilson for 22 years. He's been making art for 30 years. Tom is a fighter. He's had to fight for acceptance, for recognition, and addiction. But the entire time I've known him, he has had this force, this force and need to create. Before we start our conversation, though, I would, uh, I'd like to ask him to play us a tune. Okay. okay. All right. Tom Wilson. <laughs> This is a song that was a big hit one time. And it was in a TV show called The Party of Five. And they used to bring me money in a pickup truck and dump it on my front lawn. And I took that money and I spent it on drugs. <laughs> Which is why I'm here playing for you today. Towers, listen to them singing in the pine. Wind the clocks to tighten, all the radios are glowing in the dark. The mothers lie down in the daytime. And dream about Hollywood I know that they'd get there If they could It's just a matter of time Before we get to shine It's not a question of where or who does the crime. Show our skin, picture windows, sit around cross legged on the floor. Ah, living rooms, electric TVs, light bulbs, irons, cancer to the core. Out in the backyards waiting for women in flying saucers. Under the stars Empower life. It's just a matter of time before we get to shine. It's not a question of way or who does the crime. It's just a matter of time before we get to shine. Before we get to shine. Yeah. Shine. Again. 
It's just a matter of time before we get to shine. It's not a question of way or who does the crime. It's just a matter of time before we get to shine. Yeah, yeah. It's just a matter of time before we get to shine yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> did we travel through time we there? did <laughs> i think we did so tom yes allison have you ever been in a bar fight yeah oh yeah <laughs> look at my face i usually, <laughs> I usually lose them for one thing and uh i would luckily um back like back in hamilton days we had a lot of uh bikers that wore i guess what you call colors I won't mention any names, but uh, they had uh, colors on their back, and they were our friends. So uh, we didn't get in too much trouble with anybody, and we are always guaranteed in getting paid. Right. Which was, you know, an That's important a bonus. part. Big time. All right, well, just to give everybody a little bit of uh, context, as I mentioned off the top, you've been making art, making music for 30 years. Mm -hmm. You're a three-time Juno winner. Yeah, You've released 14 albums. I didn't know that. You have, I guarantee it, including three solo records. Mm -hmm. You've acted in movies. Yes. You're a painter, mm -hmm. and you're working on a book. Yeah. Wow. I know. Pretty amazing. Wow, well, I think so. Now, you mentioned Hamilton. It all, it all started in Hamilton. You grew up poor. Yeah. Bikers. Well, I grew up, uh, I grew up, um, my, uh, my father was blinded in the Second World War. He was a tail gunner you know, Lancaster bomber. My, my, uh, the people who raised me, my parents, Bunny and George Wilson, were quite old. And uh, so there was no, there was no money for anything, you know. And uh, so the idea of becoming a, an artist and a communicator was kind of like I got nothing to lose, you know what I mean? It's not like, uh, you know, I had a trust fund or... Uh, was planning, I had money saved, anyone saved any money for me to go to like university or anything like that. So, I mean, uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, I think it, it makes, it's a good uh, training ground. Poverty is often a good inspiration. It's a good place to leave. It's a good place that you never want to go back to. And uh, when you are on your own as an artist, it makes you fight to never have to have a coat hanger getting reception in the back of a black and white TV ever again. So is it true that you wrote your first song at 12? Yeah, I, I wrote, started writing at 12. I got my first guitar at 12 too. And that's part of, uh, I guess, but I, I don't even wanna say poverty. My, uh, Bunny and George Wilson worked really hard and they, they loved the hell out of me. And I, I, I don't want any bad reflection on them ever. Um, but there was no money and I wanted a guitar so badly. And down at Waddington's Music on James Street North in Hamilton, they um, offered a uh, situation where if you went and signed up for lessons and gave your name and address, maybe a check, they would give you a guitar to practice on oh. for your lessons. So I went down and I used a fake name and a fake address <laughs> and got a guitar for, I couldn't believe how easy it was. <laughs> The got, beginning. <laughs> yeah, I got this guitar and uh, and brought it home, and that's what I started to play on. But I brought it home and um, was I had like uh, I was learning uh, Neil Young songs and 
Leonard Cohen songs and Gordon Lightfoot songs. And I had, you know, I'd also managed to, uh, you know, procure some music books that had the pictures of the chords, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was learning these songs and I'd go around the neighborhood, other guys are playing guitar, other girls are playing guitar and I'd play songs. They'd say, that's not right, that's not how it goes at all. And I got really mad about that and I got fed up with being told how to play Neil Young songs and so I figured, well, I'm just gonna start writing my own songs because then uh, nobody will have anything to say about it. If I feel like changing them or if I don't get them right, it's my, that's my thing, right? Do you remember the name of that first song? Uh, I think, <laughs> uh, I think it was, oh, it was something fucking totally cheese. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, be my lady tonight or something yeah. like that. It was definitely for a girl because the other thing about playing guitar and being a musician is that, you know, you there was chicks. a better chance to get laid, you know what I mean? And, um, yeah. And, 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 and you know what? It's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, you sell your first song to George Thorogood. Yeah, you, well, that was the first time I had any kind of success, We're, I guess. we're making a bit, a bit of a jump. We're going to jump through we're, the we're Actually, years. you know what? We're only jumping, believe it or not, like uh, six years. Wow. Yeah, I was so about eight, 18. Mm. It's about so, 18, yeah. So you sell this song to George Thorogood and you go to L.A., well, yeah, I saw the, it's, it's, it's like uh, George Thurgood needs songs because he doesn't write songs. And uh, they, they wanted the song that I played. I played in this like punk rock, um, rockabilly band. But we wrote all our own songs. That was the one thing about what I did is that I always went out and played my own music for better or for worse. Um, I live and die by, by trying to be original. And uh, yeah, so they came and we signed a contract and I uh, went to George Thurgood and I thought I was going to take on the world and I ended up, uh, the George Thurgood, that was the, uh, an album called Bad to the Bone. Yeah. Like one of the biggest hockey songs of all time, right? <laughs> so Bastard decides he's going to start writing songs just when I, mm. you know, get this song uh, set up for his record. And uh, so he never, he never ended up recording it because he wrote Bad to the Bone, which was like a much better song, to be quite honest with you. And I went to LA, I was uh, probably 19 by then, and I thought I was gonna take on the world. And I ended up, um, I lived a, a block off Hollywood Boulevard, and I ended up uh, playing guitar and selling hash to tourists in front of Groman's Chinese Theater <laughs> and uh, living off chili dogs, um, but still writing songs. And it was uh, an experience that, you know, I realized that, uh, that uh, life was really hard, you know? Uh, and I needed to take that leap of faith in myself. But I mean, I, was, I didn't have any of the tools. I wasn't, you know, I was 19 years old. I was like, you know, selling drugs and, uh, uh, you know, and also eating chili dogs is gonna do nothing to help you, you know, think things out properly, you know what I mean? Like not a vegetable in sight. So, I mean, there's no chance of me ever coming, you know, putting two thoughts together that worked. Um, and so, uh, so that was a complete failure. I ended up saving enough money from playing out there that I could get a plane ticket home, and I flew home and uh, started a band and uh, took it from there. Right on. So let's, let's go through the bands. Oh. Um, Florida Razors. Yeah. And then Junk House, and that's where I met you. Yeah, you met me in Junk House. Well, Florida Razors were, at the time, an independent band. And it's funny because uh, I talked to... I see people saying, you know, I don't know how to do this. And it was like, I I'm getting to the point in my life where it's like, when I was your age, I <laughs> but when I was 21, I swear, we had like, uh, we had a Delta 88, beaten up Delta 88 with a band in it. And we had this domestic refrigeration truck full of PA and gear and two roadies. And I was like 21 or 22. And I, I thought, well, you know, this isn't hard to figure out. You know, I want to play music. I'll do anything to do it. So, um, you know, we got that together, and we were rather successful. We sold 7,000 LPs, which, by the way, is hard to sell in this day and age, you know. But that was, uh, and it was an independent band, and it wasn't really cool to be independent. I mean, I, I kind of... I kind of read about Colonel Saunders, you know. I didn't really take my cues from other musicians as far as doing business goes. I, I kind of took my cues from people that were also survivors, you know, and also grew up poor and also figured out how to make ends meet, you know. And Colonel Saunders used to drive around and sell chicken out of the trunk of his car, right? And I figured, well... It's kind of scary, actually, when you think about well, it. Well, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, really? Like, who was eating Chicken, that shit, especially. man? That's terrible. <laughs> um, so I, I, uh, I, I thought, well, I, I'll just do the same thing. I'll just mit, print up records. I don't need a record store. I don't need to share the money with anybody. And that's what, uh, that's what I did. I, I sold records and other things I sold. Them, yeah, of course. Well, but right. I quit music for two years because I got really bummed out and we weren't going anywhere. And we were out of hand anyways, you know what I mean? We were a bunch of knuckleheads from Hamilton. And uh, we were, uh, you know, I kind of figured out how to make money, you know, kind of, you know, hand, hand to mouth living, right? You know, so I mean, I figured out how to do everything under the table back then. And um, it allowed me to be able to write songs still, but I got really bummed out and I quit music. And also I wanted to buy a house and you couldn't buy a house if you're like, you know, what do you do? Well, you know, I sell speed and I play rock and roll, you know. Like, you know, nobody's Excellent. really going to give you. I know. <laughs> yes, we're, we'll give you that mortgage for sure. Um, uh, so I, uh, I got a job uh, doing construction and, um, and then another job doing landscaping in about a year and a half time. And uh, I ran into Daniel Lanois, um, a Hamilton guy. He's also a record producer. Uh, probably one of the most successful <laughs> record producers of our generation, but for me, he was a Hamilton guy, and he invited me down to New Orleans to, um, to kind of hang out and to gather myself. He said, you should come down, come and hang out with me, come and hang out the door. So I went down to New Orleans to um, this beautiful old house in the uh, French Quarter, uh, and he, they called the studio Kingsway. It was gorgeous. And um, I didn't have any faith in myself at that time. But it seems that I'd be sitting there and I'd, op I'd go and open the door for people and the Neville brothers would walk through, you know, or Bob Dylan would walk through. And Malcolm Byrne, Daniel Lanois would be mixing something and they'd say, I don't know if it's right or not. And they'd turn around to me and they'd say, uh, how's it sound, Tom? And I was astonished because up in Canada, nobody asked my opinion about anything. And here I was sitting with, you know, these guys making the, uh, I think he was making, uh, uh, it wasn't time out of mind. It was the album before that for Dylan. And so all of a sudden I got my confidence and I was around artists and I was around people that worked every day from the moment they got up. Daniel Lanois is the hardest working person I've ever met in my life out of any, anything, out of music or business or anything. And that work ethic was something that I had already had instilled in me, being a Hamilton guy. But I realized that I had to wake up in the morning and I had to give everything I had. And that if I didn't do that, I didn't stand a chance. And if I didn't do that, then what was I doing this for? So that's how I went back and I started Junk House. Right. And then I met you. You were my <laughs> prog manager. And people were just giving us money. And it's great. So you, you formed Junk House. Yeah. You... Ultimately released three albums. Yeah. You also released a solo album in there. Yeah. Uh, Junkhouse, more or, I mean, I know you reunited, but you more or less kind of disband at some point in 97, that. 97, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we had, um, I mean, it, it was really exciting, Allison. I mean, you made our first video with us with Jeff Weinridge. It was really exciting. I mean, I remember being, I was out for dinner with, um, the president of Sony at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, they said that he really was thinking of signing me, but he also had this Toronto Queen Street act that he wanted to sign. And it was the first time I was like, well, not the first time, but I felt, I still feel bad to this day. I completely cut their throat. <laughs> um, I said, listen, you know what? You can sign this Queen Street band and you're gonna be on the cover Now magazine in Toronto and you're gonna be in much music and you're gonna be the toast of the town, you're gonna to be the coolest label in Toronto for signing this band. I said, but that's all you're gonna get out of them. Or you can sign me, and I'm gonna make music, and I'm gonna sell records, and I'm gonna have thousands of people come to see me in Red Deer, Alberta, and Leth <laughs> and Lethbridge, <laughs> and Brandon, Manitoba, and Charlottetown, PEI because I knew the music that I, I, I wasn't making music to pose or to try and be cool. I'm the most uncool person you'll ever meet in your life. So why bother trying to be cool? I wanted to make music that communicated with people and I wanted to be not, I wanted to be true to myself, number one. Number two, I wanted as many people to hear my music, like it and give me money for it that I could possibly find. And you know what? I did it. 
Now, all that, you know, what I found amazing at the time was you called yourself a folk singer. That's right. I still am a folk singer. Yeah. Yeah. And yet you've, you've battled seemingly with the folk establishment. You've not felt recognized by them. Why is that? Well, because they're dicks, for one thing. <laughs> um, okay, then. <laughs> uh, not across the board, but I mean, uh, you know, there's enough dicks in that uh, in that field that you know. Do you know, think it, you scared them? Were I completely scared them. Look at me. I mean, I I mean, I I am probably the last great Canadian folk singer, uh, and it's because I sing songs and I mm -hmm. sing music that is in the tradition of folk music, where what goes on around my fire, I bring over to your fire. It's storytelling and it's messages and it's not trying to be Lee Harvey Osmond, the band I have now, is like we we write songs about addiction and depression and native land rights. There is no way we are going to get any airplay ever. But you know what? We are definitely yeah. we are down in the groove of making this music. So and, and the funny thing is, is that um, I was up for a Juno for folk and uh, traditional, I guess traditional and folk, whatever, a couple years ago, and the, the folk community was up in arms. The ma album, by the way, was called Folk, folk Sinner, Sinner, right? And I got uh, this, this, this great, actually a, a magazine I admire here in Canada, a folk magazine, the folk magazine, an, an Americana magazine in this country, called me up, basically reprimanded me for, um, for going into that, you know what I mean? For, for how, where do you get off calling yourself a folk singer and being in this category. And, and kind of, I, I kind of had to straighten the situation out over the phone, you know. But it was very annoying and I've been living with that, but I grew up at the Feed House and when I got out to play, this is going back to 75, 76, I grew up at the Feet. The people who gave me a break were the same people that gave Fred Eaglesmith a break. Willie P. Bennett, yeah. Stan Rogers, David Whiff and Brent Titcomb, John Allen Cameron. These were, those the are, those are the folk, those, yeah. that's like, that's like the, the circle of folk culture in Canada. And they were the guys that kind of said, you know what, don't worry what these people say, just come with us and do your thing. So I thank them. And you know what, I didn't mean to call anybody a dick, but you know. It's just how you express yourself. <laughs> Sometimes you just, you know, why not be honest, you know. Well, and you mentioned Willie P. Bennett, ultimately, uh -huh. that, you know, that relationship with his music, his yeah. songs, uh, created another band, Blackie and the Rodeo Kings, along with Colin Linden and Stephen Fearing. How, tell me about the time that the three of you met, because not everybody would think it would be likely that the three of you would necessarily end up together. No, I know, people went on about that for years, you know, how did, well, mostly they went, Stephen and Colin said, how did you end up with him, <laughs> you know? Um, but uh, the, the Colin I met in 1976 in a field at a folk festival, and he was uh, a year younger than me, and um, I couldn't believe the way he could play guitar he was the most incredible blues guitar player. And I found out later, of course, he was playing with Howlin' Wolf when he was 11 years old, you know. And um, his dedication to that craft is like no one else's on the planet, I don't think. Anyways, that's where I met Colin. So we've known each other all these years and um, never hung out, but we were always friends. And Steve and I just met uh, through a friend named Pam Seal in, in Vancouver who said, you gotta meet Pam Seal. Anyways, they were, making a, they were going to make a record. They went to Bernie Finkelstein. And they were gonna make this record of songs by Blackie and the Rodeo Kings and they needed a third member. And they said, well, the only other big Willie P. Bennett fan that we know is Tom Wilson. So um, they called me up and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that for sure. And we, we made this record and I had to go, I was making a film in Costa Rica. So I literally recorded the record in January um, and finished the last session for me. And I said, I gotta go guys, I gotta get on a plane and, and meet this film crew. And so I left and I didn't think anything more of it because Junk House was still happening. Junk House was still like, you know, playing big halls and selling lots of records and, and all that kind of stuff, right? And um, that was it. And then we got a call, Bernie Finkelstein started getting calls wanting to book Blackie and the Rodeo Kings. And uh, that was 20 years made. ago. <laughs> Pardon me? You got those fantastic suits made. Oh, we had those great suits made, which I hate now. <laughs> so eight albums later, wow. Yeah. That's been a... Well, true, it's a, it's a labor of lust. 
and it's it's making music with people. Uh, I will only make music with people who uh, who don't want to show off. Mm. It's a Bob Lanois line. Daniel Lanois' brother is that you know the most important thing that you can bring to art, whether it be visual art or acting or music, writing is to not show off because you can play a million notes. A million notes don't mean anything. Three notes mean a lot. So um, in Blackie and the Rodeo Kings, we, um, we serve the song. We serve the music first. In Lee Harvey Osmond, we, I find people from the Cowboy Junkies and the Sadies, and I find Hoxley Workman and O Susanna. Um, these are all people uh, that walk into a room and uh, are not there to show off. They're there to serve the music that's in front of them. And that's a trick, you know, that's as hard a lesson to learn as anything because we all want to, we think that doing our best is being the loudest, you know, or the fastest because that's the way society works. You gotta be the strongest and you gotta be the fastest and you gotta be the loudest to survive in the jungle that has been built for us. But in art, those are not the rules. You once told me that Lee Harvey Osmond was the truest voice you'd had. Mm -hmm. It still is. Why? Um, because it, it went right back to the, uh, it went f deeper into the folk tradition for me. Um, everything that Lee Harvey Osmond does has got to be played around a kitchen table. You need a pack of smokes and a pot of coffee and I can sit and play any of those songs to you and they will translate and uh, they'll communicate with you the same way as if I had the seven piece band yeah. out on the road, you know what I mean? It doesn't take, uh, doesn't take anything except the simplicity of the song and, uh, and the dedication to communicating it to you. And I get to do that every night. You know what I find interesting, because I, I knew you through all of those years and you were addicted. Yep. Heroin, cocaine, alcohol. Mm -hmm. And yet, ultimately, I never had a, I never had a problem communicating with you. And I never felt that you didn't communicate through your art. No. Oh, uh, that's the trick of being an addict though. <laughs> How do you know when an addict's lying? When their mouth is moving, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> so I was, I was an expert at hiding uh, my drug addiction and my alcohol, and uh, I saved it for uh, I saved it for when the doors were closed. You know, it seeped out into my professional life, and uh, it seeped into my personal life. My first wife, the mother of my children, and we're grandparents together, said, "You know what? If I had to choose any, I can't believe." that I chose the fattest junkie on the planet. Because <laughs> she said, even though I was a junkie, that it was like, you never lose any weight. I always see on TV and the movies, the junkies are really skinny people. How are you a junkie, you know, so. Now, when you were, when you were going through and getting clean and sober, and of course this happened over a period of time, mm -hmm. were you ever worried that that truth, that communication might change, that ultimately the Oh my might... God, yes. I mean, I, I, leaned on, uh, I leaned on booze and drugs uh, my entire life. In fact, I'll tell you, Allison, I got out of rehab and uh, a couple months later, the first time I was at the Calgary Folk Festival. You were probably there. Mm -hmm. Blackie and the Rodeo Kings were playing and, uh, and I, I, we had it set up. I got off the plane. They had a car and a driver for me. They drove me to the back of the stage. I was like Lenny Kravitz, really, you know. <laughs> they drove me to the back of the stage. I got out, got on stage, played the show, said thank you very much, got back in the car, went right to the airport, went home. But when I was on that stage with Stephen and Colin, who are my brothers and who I love, I felt like, oh my God, I'm so attached. I'm so in, gr in the groove. I'm, so present. I said, what the hell's going on? It was like, oh, I'd been playing music on drugs and alcohol my entire life. Right. And for the first time, it was like, this is really great. Being, uh, being clean and sober has actually got some benefits to it, you know? And then it was at that moment that I realized, you know what, I actually don't need to lean on that shit to be able to, um, to do what I want to do. And it was after that that you started to paint. 
1997, I started to paint um, for two reasons. One, because I stopped drinking the first time. I successfully quit drinking in 1999. It'll be actually 16 years, December the 12th. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, but I quit, um, uh, I quit drinking for a while there in 97. And uh, the same wife, uh, Sandy Shaw, said, um, you know what, she's, you're, you're an artist of some kind, why don't you paint some stuff for the house? So I started doing these paintings. Uh, that, that's one of them right there. That's a more recent one. But I started doing these paintings and, um, uh, I, you know, ch charity uh, benefits would come up and people would come to my house. The first time was a woman's shelter that came to my house and said, would you, could you give us some autographed CDs to raise money for our women's shelter because we're going down and we need to, you know, house these, these abused women. I said, yes, of course. They said, would you like a painting? They said, yeah. That would be great. Wow. So they put the paintings in the silent auction. They came back to me, and then breast cancer came to me and, and said, you know, will you, do, will you sign some CDs? And I said, would you like a painting? <laughs> they, said, they said, yeah, we'd love a painting. So I, kept, I was doing these paintings, right? And then I got asked to do this show in Toronto and Queen Street West at this, you know, kind of very hip gallery, and it was myself and Michael Stipe uh, from REM, Daniel Lanois, again, long, the late Long John Baldry. We did this art show this um, together, the, uh, the four of us. And uh, the curator of the gallery, you know, came up to me and says, okay, this is great, we love this art. Well, how much, what do you charge for this? And I said, well, I don't know, I, I usually just give it away. Uh, and he said, okay. He said, well, what do you think it's worth? I said, well, I don't know. 500 bucks? He says, I can't make any fucking money of 500 bucks. <laughs> and he went around the room and he put like $3,000, $4,000, $4,500, $5,000 on my paintings. I was like, you're nuts. And they all sold. So uh, I kept on painting. <laughs> was... So what is the difference in the expression when you paint compared to when you write? Um, uh, there, there's a, a more of a meditation uh, for me because I'm face to face with the canvas and it is complete seclusion and it's also satisfaction because that moment uh, that you're face to face with the canvas and you're putting your colors on, I do everything by hand and I'm also writing words, I write all lyrics into these paintings and the bigger the paintings get the more stream of consciousness happens. So all of a sudden I'm writing and scratching in the paintings and I don't actually know what I've been writing or scratching until I sold one to Manulife in Toronto, giant one, and they called me a month later. They said, we're getting a lot of complaints about your painting. I said, why? They said, well, do you know what you've written in that painting? And I said, no, I, I don't. And there were some, there were some swear words in it. And, <laughs> and people were like, you know, going with their lawyers and going to do their manu life jobs, you know, and things and reading the painting while they're waiting for the elevator. It was like, <laughs> what? You know, so, so, uh, so there is that. But I mean, um, it's, there's no apologies, right? It's art. It's the moment, you know, we all live in, in art. We, we create moments to live inside. We create moments that didn't exist for anybody before or after that moment. And we, that's, what, that's what we thrive for. Because it doesn't matter if you're selling paintings, you know, or records out of the back of your trunk of your car, or if you're playing for three people a night or 3,000 people a night, or if you're making a lot of money or no money. It doesn't make any difference. Artists don't. Ultimately, the artists don't care about that. They care about creating that moment to live in where it's almost like thrill seekers because when you create in that moment, it's unbelievable and it's satisfying and it keeps you going for another day. Artists are like the Joker in Batman. The Joker in Batman, Batman burns money and he does things that nobody can figure out why he's doing them. They can't stop the Joker because they can't figure out why he's doing them. And artists, if you think about it, nobody really knows except the artist why you're doing this. There's no 
It's a job where you are completely only accountable for yourself in that moment. And that, Allison, is ultimate freedom. Wow. Wow. Okay, so tell me about the book and and the writing and have has it somehow made you look at your life differently has it resonated back uh, some kind of reflection yeah i uh i didn't realize <laughs> i didn't realize how interesting i was <laughs> <laughs> i i didn't realize um i didn't realize that i had a story to tell until um until somebody cracked uh, cracked the shell on the whole thing three years ago. My journey started three years ago. I had an interesting upbringing. I told you my father was war blinded. He was a tail gunner in a Lancaster bomber. My parents were quite old. And um, the only relatives that ever got in the house, the only people that ever got in the house were relatives. They didn't have any friends. Only relatives, and I used to, I mean, one story I tell, and you've, you've heard this story before. I, I used to have this uh, Mohawk uncle named uh, Jim Bove, who used to come down. He was an iron worker in New York City. And he used to come down and stay at my house, and he brought a guitar. He was five feet tall and 300 pounds. Mohawk guy. He was like a brown marshmallow. He was unbelievable. And he'd sit at the kitchen table and he'd play guitar and he played Hank Williams and you know uh, Hank Snow and Roger Miller songs my father was blind and he'd be sitting at the kitchen table and they'd have a bottle of whiskey on the table and they'd be drinking on a Saturday night right 1966 and uh, you know nothing good is gonna happen with two guys sitting at a kitchen table on a Saturday night and a bottle of rye in the middle of them, right? And every time, it's like, it happened, when I say every time, it seems like it happened every week when I look back at it. It probably happened two or three times that my uncle would be playing the guitar, my dad, blind, would get pissed off, right? They'd start fighting in the middle of the kitchen, right? And I always say to, I say to people, I don't know what you paid to get in here, but if you really wanted to see a show, <laughs> you should have been in my kitchen in 1966 to see a blind man fight a five foot, 300 pound Indian. Now there's some entertainment, folks. <laughs> there's some art. So. People want, you know, people wonder why I am the way I am, you know. But I mean, it's it's these experiences in our life that don't, if if we treat them with respect, and we recognize the beauty inside people, then they don't come back to haunt us. And we survive through these things. We survive through so much in our lives. Everybody here has a story. We all have a story. We're all survivors. And in those survivor skills that we have is where the art is created. It's where if we come to some kind of conclusion on it in our lives and we are able to rest with it, it's actually the thing that inspires us. And if we talk about it, if we make jokes about it, you know, we're able to communicate it. And then all of a sudden people give us a lot of money and we write a book. The book. Yeah. What does writing it, does writing it down, is that, does that imprint a different way for you? Does that, does that allow you to express in an, an, again, another level? I'm just, I'm just starting to, uh, I can't say figure it out. That's, that's, that's completely wrong. I'm just starting to live inside it, mm. what it is to write a book, what it is to write without music to support you, mm -hmm. or without visuals to mm -hmm. support you, what it is to create a story. It's funny because I started writing and um, I was really nervous, right? I started writing some of these stories. I wrote a story about uh, the war amps pool. I grew up going to war amps conventions with blind people and men without arms and men without legs and a lot of fighting and a lot of alcohol. But these people were angels. They were the f people that went and threw down for a Canada. And they were pretty well forgotten but they knew each other and they stuck together and it was like, you know, they had their own gang, man. 
And so I grew up as a baby, as a kid around that. My Santa Claus had one arm and he held a, a Blabat's 50 bottle in one and his wife called out the names of the kids and we'd get up on Santa's <laughs> knee and he had one arm. And, uh, you know, we were given some, I don't know, some kind of toy. That was Christmas time, right? So um, uh, that's, there's no healing to go along with that because that was my life. And I wrote this story about the amp's pool that my mother used to uh, take me to. She used to smoke uh, uh, export planes, no filter, Ooh. right? And she, I remember she her, was she, a was, real smoker. she was beautiful. Bunny Wilson was like, she was a model in Montreal at one time. Mm. She was gorgeous and she was tough as nails, man. And she used to, uh, she used to walk me down and on the way down to the pool, she told me, oh yeah, this is where uh, Len Fairclough's son, you know, chained himself to a wheelchair and wheeled himself in the pool and killed himself. It's like, wow. Oh, it's also where, you know, Chris Devino, uh, he was blind. He jumped off the, uh, uh, diving board. There was no water in the pool. You, you know, oh. it's never the same. So I was like, I was like yeah. once again, six, seven years old, right? I'm in this like tight lime green bathing suit, you know, <laughs> going chubby kid going to this pool, and you know, my mom would say, "Get in the water, go ahead," you know, and she'd sit there and she'd be reading the Spectator, having a smoke, right? And I'd be in the pool, bobbing up and down, thinking about this kid in a wheelchair that committed suicide <laughs> and Chris Davino breaking his neck at the bottom of an empty pool. And I was like swimming to the top and trying to say, help me. And she was like. You doing okay? Yeah. <laughs> Keep swimming. Okay, yeah. well. So I told this story. Okay. And uh, I wrote this story and I sent it to my editor at Random House. And um, I didn't hear from her for six weeks. I sent that one and half a dozen other stories kind of touching on um, uh, parts of my life, parts of my uh, young life. Um, and uh, she, wrote, she finally wrote back to me and she goes, I am literally laughing out loud on the streetcars in Toronto. She goes, the TTC, I I'm, I'm, I'm can't stop laughing. She goes, your writing is exactly like talking to you. She said that you, uh, you've managed to be able to take what you say in public or the way you are and be able to put it onto, uh, into a story and it's like sitting down talking with me. But by the way, is something at the age of 56 that I also figured out is that I can only be myself. So the person that I am right now is probably if I met with any of you in, um, in those rooms back there, it was probably the same guy that you met there. I'm, I'm the same guy across the board. I don't change, you know, it's not like, I'm putting on an act. So, uh, you know what, honesty, uh, honesty in art is, is very important. Be who you are and be proud of who you are because that means something to the world. So is she the one that offered you the book deal? No, another guy. I, I told the story of, um, of how I found out about my adoption on Definitely Not the Opera Which with uh, Suki and Lee, right? So I tell this story on, on Definitely Not the Opera of how three years ago I'm going out on a speaking tour. I was wearing like a microphone like this too, which is very annoying, it's very distracting. <laughs> um, so I go out and I'm, I'm done this, going out the speaking tour. They give you a handler so that, uh, you know, that you can't basically go off track. So the handler picks you up in a limousine, takes you to the airport, gets you, the, gets you to the hotel, gets you to the gig, gets you to the airport, gets you home. You don't have to think at all. So this handler, this young girl comes She's uh, my handler. She goes, oh, I'm so excited. This is great. I'm a fan of yours, and we're going to Regina. And so, <laughs> <laughs> all right. And, um, and she goes, and you don't know this. I've been meaning to run into you. I've been hoping to run into you for years because your mother and my grandmother were friends. And I said, you know, I said, I grew up. Dad was blind. Parents were older. A lot of drinking. Very dark. I said, relatives came down from Quebec, but those were the only people that ever got in the house. My mom, my mother didn't have any friends in Hamilton. She goes, no, she goes, my, my, my grandmother's named Mary Brennan. And I said, oh my God, Mary Brennan? I said, I can't believe, I haven't heard that name in years. This is unbelievable. I said, I'm, I'm actually moved because I didn't realize that my mother had any friends and you've just reminded me. She goes, yes, they were really good friends. I said, yes, you're right, they were good friends. She goes, my mother's name was Suzanne Brennan. I was like, oh my God, it was Suzanne Brennan. That was my only babysitter when I was a kid. I said, I'm thrilled. And also, I'm war my heart is warm that I can remember now that my mother had friends in Hamilton. You know, it makes me feel good. She goes, yes, in fact, they were all so close that they were there the day you were adopted. Mm. Mm. What? 
<laughs> yes, they were there the day you were adopted. So that started a three-year journey. I told that story on Definitely Not the Opera because they don't tell you what the theme is going to be. And they, I went into CBC and uh, they said, the theme is you meet a stranger that changes your life. And I just let that story out. And that was a secret that my family kept for, at that time, 53 years. And I just told it to millions of people around the world on CBC. I went out and got in the fetal position on Queen Street. It was like, I couldn't believe what I had just done. And then I got a call from, you know, some radio, big radio station shows in the US wanted me to go to Chicago and they want me to read, tell my story. And then I got a, a call from um, uh, Random House, from Dave Bedini and from Random House that said, have you ever thought of writing a book? And I said, fuck no, that seems like way too much work. Um, and, but so they had me in for this meeting and I go into this boardroom. This is very similar to me being signed to Sony, right? <laughs> I go into this boardroom and uh, they have coffee and snacks, right? So I'm happy as can be because I'm eating <laughs> and I'm talking to them and I'm in there for two hours and they say, we, we've never met anyone like you before. And uh, they, uh, they send these contracts over to my lawyer and, and now uh, I'm an author. So wow. I never thought that would happen. I usually say, when I tell this story live, I say I would like to thank all my English teachers from high school <laughs> very much. Thank you very much for having the faith in me. Okay, so what, after this all happened, what, for many people, this is a seriously life-altering awareness, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, their life changes. They're... You, it seems like you've just kind of rolled with it. Everything I've read and speaking with yeah. you, like you, you're like, hey, whatever, man. I love my parents. I love the people that raised me. It opened up my heart to the people that raised me. My heart burst wide open with love for them, for uh, an older couple and a blind man to take in a baby who they didn't have to. They ended up being my great aunt and uncle. Um, also... Um, I don't preach about it, but being clean and sober, definitely. I mean, I'm nuts as it is, right? I don't need drugs. But being clean and sober was helpful. But the thing that helped me the most was that I have so much love around me mm -hmm. that I, I really am the luckiest man on, on the planet. I have, I have my kids. I have my grandkids. Both my wives love me. My ex-wives, you know. All my ex-girlfriends still love me. My new girlfriend loves me <laughs> you people <laughs> love me <laughs> so so because because i was so grounded with that it didn't mess me up in the meantime um i i found out who my mother was i was driving home a year ago on my 55th birthday and uh with my cousin my cousin is like the matriarch of my family my cousin is uh the person who sits at the head of the table and she's at all the births. She was at the births of all my, both my kids, my grandkids. She's there for Thanksgiving, Christmas. It's not a family function without Janie there. And I'm driving Janie home, and I, she's the only relative I have alive that I can talk to about this, and I haven't talked to her about it. I've been doing my own research, and I said, Janie, you know what? I'm 55 years old. I said, I found out a couple years ago that mom and dad weren't in fact my mom and dad and you're the only relative i have alive that can help me out can you maybe when you feel comfortable let me know and she said uh, tom i don't know how to tell you this and i hope you forgive me but i'm your mother so it opened up another world for me first of all i want you to picture this this is a woman that has held this secret that has been beaten down by this secret her entire life she has sat at that table that I told you about and never said anything with me, her son, with her grandkids and with her great grandsons. If it was any of us, we'd said, okay, listen, everybody, I think you better sit down. I got something I got to tell you here, but she never did. Did she talk to you about that, about how, how that felt? She is one of the most loving people I've ever I'll ever know, and she is uh, tough as hell. She's a Mohawk. 
Mohawk and French. My father, I found out, is a Mohawk. Uh, I grew up thinking I was an Irish guy all my life, which I also joke about answers the questions why whenever I hear bagpipes, I want to come out shooting. <laughs> um, yeah, so it ends up that I'm this big Mohawk guy instead of this big Irish guy. Uh, in the meantime, in the last, only since last summer, I met, I grew up an only child, and I met six of my nine brothers and sisters. So in writing this book, and it's funny, I was talking to, uh, uh, I, I won't mention the name, but I was talking with somebody earlier today in one of my meetings with the artists here, and I said, you know, it's important to get space between the events in your life and creating the art that honors your life. When you get into your 50s, you realize that you've created a work of art and it's your life and that you can't go back and change anything and you start to embrace all the scars, all the impurities, all the mistakes become part of a canvas or a piece of music that can, is a piece of work of art. And uh, uh, that, that's the way it is for me. So I'm getting some distance right now between um, hanging out with my crazy sisters who are so wonderful and, and uh, my brother. Uh, so I'm getting some distance from that and figuring out what that means to me. In fact, after I leave here and get home, I'm going up to um, Kahnawake, Kahnawake, Cognawaga. It's a reserve outside of Montreal and I'm going up to visit them before Christmas because I haven't seen them since I've been on tour for the last three months. Okay, we don't have much time, so I want to touch on a couple Why? of things. <laughs> um, how has all of this impacted your own children? Because they also are, Madeline works with you in yeah, the Madeline business. Yeah, Madeline does business with and me. And your yeah. son is, in, is an artist. Yep. in Harlem Pepper. How, how has that impacted how you mentor, how you have taught and shared with them? Well, you know, if you do it right, your children look out for you as much as you look out for them. They know you so well. My kids know me so well. I hate that Crosby, Stills, and Nash song, Teach Your Children. Hate it sucks but it's true um it's uh, it's just one of those things where uh, you keep an eye out for each other right so uh, how it resonates with my son um I, I, we've, we've watched that because not only has it resonated with him but later on i'll show you pictures on my phone of my son and of my nephews my sister's kids they're identical right it's it's a little freaky man it's a little freaky. And my daughter, my first thing my daughter says, oh my God, I'm an Indian. Thank God it finally it finally answers why I have such a weird body. <laughs> right? <laughs> she says, now I know why. But uh, she's always, uh, she's she always suspected. She uh, looks native. Um, and uh, she's always been interested in Aboriginal studies and always looked out for, uh, for uh, Aboriginal uh, concerns, I don't know more, the unbelievable, the un heart-wrenching story of the missing women in this country are, uh, are something that uh, we should never stop thinking about and never stop trying to, to change, you know? It's the way it goes. So she's always been involved in that. But, uh, so that's the answer to that. All right, well... I say uh, thank you for sharing the, oh, your great. truth. Oh, great. Good, Your Thanks. truth. It's been amazing. It's been great, Al.